Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This week, we have come to episode 40, and we are taking our first steps into a larger world. As we have our first SNES game and our first Star Wars game in Nintendo Power, number 28, for September of 1991. We've got eight games this issue, so we have a lot of ground to cover. And I'll also be splitting this episode in half, because I've now got a 15-minute length limit again on my YouTube account. So... Let's get started. Our cover for this issue is Super Mario World. We have Mario and Yoshi, large and in charge, with a painted cover instead of a diorama. This isn't going to be the last of our dioramas, but it would have been nice for a title this big to get one. In our, in our letters column, we had a solicitation for suggestions for future players' poll contest ideas in a past issue, and here we get the ones that didn't win. Now, the winning contest entry was a trip to see the American Gladiators live, plus a chance to do some of the stunts from the show and get a copy of the NES game. My personal favorite of the rejects, though, was a recommendation that they bring back the Final Fantasy Treasure Hunt. With the upcoming release of Final Fantasy II on the SNES, that actually sounds like a pretty good idea. We now have come to the first Super Nintendo game to be featured in the magazine with Super Mario World. We have a rundown of the powers Mario and Yoshi can get, along with info on the game's enemies and their tactics. Rather than giving individual level maps, we get overworld maps for each of the game's eight areas, and brief notes on each level. No full maps, though. We may get more coverage later, but to heck with it. As of this issue, the game is out. Let's play this thing. Super Mario World is, in my opinion, the definitive Mario game. It rewards exploration in a way that the series really hadn't since Mar Super Mario Bros. 2. It has a variety of power-ups like Super Mario Bros. 3, but not so many that you have power-ups that only feel useful in edge cases. Everything works, giving us a platformer that just runs like a well-oiled machine. You can explore pretty much everywhere in the world, and you can navigate things just perfectly if you've got, of course, the skill. In Nestor's Adventures, this time Nestor's providing a tip for Bill and Ted's excellent video game adventure. However, due to how this strip is structured, I'm not quite sure what the tip is. I'm assuming that to find Lincoln in modern San Dimas, you have to go to Lincoln Park. However, that's not clear. It doesn't say if you need bait to find him, or if this is just an earlier point in the game where you're gathering the historical figures and where doesn't tell you where the bait is. We move on to our first Star Wars game thus far with the NES adaptation of the first film. The article has a drawn overworld map of Tatooine as well as screenshot maps of each of the sublevels before you reach Mos Eisley. Here's my problem with the NES Star Wars game and it's a big one. It has falling damage. In action platformers, generally, falling damage is a bad idea. Falling damage gives you the time setback and annoyance of just falling, while also adding the damage factor of spikes. Basically giving you a big time setback, and also now you've taken additional damage, which makes it harder to get back to where you were in the first place. Any place where you have falling damage in a platformer, you are really better off just having spikes or bottomless pits, unless you are playing a procedurally generated roguelike style platformer like Splunky. Frankly, falling damage, in my opinion, makes the penalty for failure too high, the and the annoyance factor also too high, and thus the usage of it in this game really hurts the game a lot. Otherwise, the controls are alright and the level design is interesting, which actually leads me to my other problem. It feels like when these levels were designed, um, the game didn't have falling damage. However, at some point, possibly while they were testing the Death Star stages, they decided that what the game needed, due to the height of those stages, was falling damage, so they decided to put it in. But when they put it in, they did not consider how this would affect the earlier levels in the game, which were designed to teach you the platforming and the controls and the running and shooting and that sort of thing. And were also designed without falling damage being present. And they didn't go back and adjust those levels accordingly, which makes sense because that's a lot of work to do. But ultimately, it hurts this game a lot, so I recommend really giving this game a miss. 
Next up is a guide for the NES version of Smash TV, which is designed to be played on two controllers, one to move and the other to shoot. We also have notes on the first three circuits. So, I'll give them points for originality for coming up with the two controller scheme. It just doesn't really work. Um, it's clunky, it's awkward. I'm assuming what they have in mind is you're supposed to hold the controllers sideways. Um, but it still didn't quite click for me. Um, it's awkward and uncomfortable to use, and this gameplay footage kind of shows the problems with this game. There's additionally no actual good reason to own this game on the NES. Between the versions designed for consoles with twin stick controllers, like those in the Midway Arcade collection, and the fact that the Super Nintendo version of Smash TV uses the D-pad and face buttons to emulate twin stick controls instead, you really don't have any reason to own this game on the NES. None at all. There are better versions that are more easily available and more accurate to the arcade version of the game. In the NES classified information column, we have some advice on how to heal up in the game Quantum Fighter Kabuki. Our next game is Kickmaster, a action martial arts RPG where you just attack with kicks. The article gives a list of the different type of kicks you can do, notes on the first three levels, and maps of levels 4, 5, and 6. It's interesting to see that basically the first quarter of the game doesn't get maps. This game was surprisingly fun. It's not without its problems, though. In particular, the angle of your standard attack kick in this game is far too steep with not enough extension. It feels like the animation is the character trying to stun their opponents with their foot funk instead of actually trying to hit them in the head. Additionally, when you defeat an enemy, instead of just getting XP or an item to boost your uh, mana points or hit points or your score, Instead, three items are tossed out of the defeated enemy in three different directions, sort of an arc, and instead of lying on the ground for you to collect, they fall through the level, requiring you to scramble to get them. Theoretically, with quick jumping, you can get all three, but further, because among the items that can be dropped is a hazardous item, you have to look to see what you're collecting, costing you further time that you could use to get your item, to get the items. That said, those are really my main problems with this game. You have a very high jump angle, and you can do kick attacks in a variety of directions, which all works really well in the game. The game even gives you a variety of power-ups, which will give you special attacks against enemies or healing your health. I'd really say this is an underrated title in the NES's library. Well, not too underrated. As of this recording, a copy of this game on eBay right now will cost you about $50. And no, this didn't get a Famicom release, so you can't import it for a lower price if you have an adapter or a Retron 5. Next up is Worm, a sort of hybrid shooter, pl platformer, a couple other things, which reminds me a little of a mix of Blaster Master and Golgo 13. The game also has narrative cutscenes like Ninja Gaiden, or, well, GoGo13, along with an element where you have a crew of characters on your ship who you need to talk to in order to progress. The article and maps on the poster cover the first six levels of the game. Much like GoGo13, Worm is a game that is a jack-of-all-trades and a master of none. On the one hand, you, you have a vehicle with regenerating shields, which, one would think, would promote a more slow, deliberate gameplay style. As you advance, you fight some enemies, let your shield regenerate, and then move on to the next fight. However, there are significant chunks of the level which have constantly, endlessly spawning enemies, encouraging you to rush. So you somewhat need to, have to rush to the next place where you can stop to let your shields recharge. Additionally, your vehicle has two movement modes. One is a Blaster Master-esque tank, but without the jumping, and the second is as a more conventional shoot-em-up vehicle, but with the spread shot on all the time. The former uses less fuel, but the latter lets you evade enemy bullets and lets you face the landscape, but often at the cost of losing your shield. And I haven't even gotten to the stages where you're getting out of the ship to explore or shooting at targets from a first-person perspective. Ultimately, though, I wouldn't call Worm a failure, nor would I call it a success. 
It's just a very, very interesting game, and one that is definitely worth the player's time. Moving on to the Game Boy titles, we have our second Final Fantasy Game Boy game in, in, as, in as many issues, with Final Fantasy Adventure. This title is more of an action RPG, which, well, makes sense, as this is the first game also in the Saiken Densetsu, or Mana, series. The guide itself has detailed maps and tips to the fourth overworld area of the game. Now, at this point in the Game Boy's life, it doesn't have its Legend of Zelda, and won't have an official Legend of Zelda title for a couple years. So, Final Fantasy Adventure does a fantastic job of basically being a third-party Legend of Zelda. The level and dungeon design isn't quite as puzzle-focused as the first Legend of Zelda, nor the rest of the games after Zelda 2, but it definitely succeeds at providing that sort of action RPG gameplay on the go, combined with the ability to save pretty much everywhere, allowing the player to safely stop playing at any time, and come back to their game whenever they're ready. Moving on to Game Boy ports of NES games, we have a port of Tecmo Bowl. The article gives notes on all 12 teams. This is a decent enough port of Tecmo Bowl for the Game Boy, but I'd say the NES version is far superior, as you have a larger list of plays to choose from. Otherwise, it's a fairly decent game, and certainly the best football game on the Game Boy thus far, which I admit is damning with faint praise. That said, I didn't have any problem switching quickly between targeted receivers during passing. Um, I will admit why I didn't have the manual with me when doing running plays, so I couldn't figure out which button was for run and which button was for dive, and what button changed players when on defense, but honestly... If you're looking for a good, portable football game for your Game Boy or GBA, this is certainly a viable option. Next up is a port for the Game Boy of Marble Madness, with notes on the first five courses. This is, quite possibly, one of the best ports to the Game Boy that I've played thus far. This version of Marble Madness really captures the essence of that game, from the pitch-perfect controls to the physics, the field of view, and the size of the sprites being just about perfect on the screen. Right to give a weakness for the game, this game, it's more a weakness that's related to the Game Boy's hardware. The Game Boy's scre screen on the original model wasn't backlit, so you'd probably have some difficulty seeing the gameplay on that system. And you would probably, at that time, have been better off playing the NES version of the game. However, now, with backlit, backlit GBAs and Game Boys that have been modded to add a backlight, I would say this game's time has come. If you want a, a portable version of Marble Madness, get this game. In the Game Boy Classified Information column, we have a code that will allow you to test drive any stage in Battle Unit Zeoth. In the SNES preview portion of this as well, we have a look at 8-Way Whipping in Super Castlevania 4, Urban Planning in SimCity, and Kicking Butt in Final Fight. Now, we have only two games in the Now Playing column this issue, Eliminator Boat Duel and Bo Jackson's Baseball, back when Bo Jackson was relevant because he played every sport. In Counselor's Corner, we have tips on which characters to use to get what crowns in Legacy of the Wizard. And in the top 30, we have two titles entering the list. There's Battletoads, which we previously covered, and the RPG Faris, which has been previewed, um, and which hasn't been reviewed in the past. Our celebrity profile this issue is of Bart Simpson, Simpson, who is a fictional character, and thus this is cheating. Boo! In Pack Watch, the NES is getting Tailspin from Capcom, and a home port of the PC RPG Might and Magic. And on the Super Nintendo side, we have looks at Darius Twin, Nosferatu, Super Battle Tank, all of which are on the way, along with rumors of the SNES release of Ease 3, Wanderers from Ease, coming to the U.S. For my picks this issue, Super Mario World is the clear choice. If you own a system that can play SNES games, it is worth your time and money to pick up a copy of this, if only to play the game through once. Putting Super Mario World aside, though, if you happen to come across Crossed a copy of Kickmaster at an affordable price. It's definitely worth picking up, though I'd say paying over $50 for it would be a bit much to me. On the Game Boy side, Final Fantasy Adventure and Marble Madness are both solid picks. 
if you're looking for something on the to play on the go, I definitely get the Game Boy version of Marble Madness. Whereas if you're looking for something to play on your Super Game Boy or Retron 5, a good to sit down and play Game Boy title, I'd go with Final Fantasy Adventure. Next time we will get further into the domain of the uh, 16-bit console generation. Um, if you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to the channel and tell your friends. Also, feel free to back the show on Patreon. There is a link on my YouTube channel up around here. If you prefer not to chip in a few bucks a month or what have you, there is also just a general tip jar on there if you just want to just throw some money my way. So, thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time.